evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for coming tonight to the National World War II Museum for another special event. Uh, my name is Jeremy Collins. I'm the conference programs manager, and it's my pleasure to bring various programs to you. Uh, this program in particular is in conjunction with our September 11th exhibition. I'll get to how we make the connection to September 11th and this, uh, this event in just a bit, but I do want to recognize our collections and exhibitions department who put this together along with all the other great ex uh, exhibitions we have. Tom Chikansky's here, uh, John Costa, who's the exhibits designer, Larry DeCures, Meg Roussel, Tony Kaiser, and I believe I saw Lindsey Barnes, so if you all could wave in the back and let me clap for you. Thank you guys for putting these great exhibits together. Uh, the exhibition is entitled September 11th, A Global Moment, and it's, uh, as I mentioned a couple times tonight, it's pretty powerful. Uh, I think everyone here would say that it's one of the darkest days in recent history, if not in all of American history, September 11th, 2001, and this time of year we're celebrating the 70th anniversary of some of the darkest days of World War II. From Pearl Harbor up until the victory at Midway, America and her allies only knew defeat. And tonight's speaker is going to speak about some of those dark days, uh, dark years in his case. But about this time, 70 years ago, Colonel Glenn Frazier was fighting on the Philippine Islands against the Japanese with his American and Filipino allies. And unfortunately for him and over 70,000 others, they had to surrender to the Japanese. Um, I'm not going to tell you how he decided to enter the military, but uh, the summer of 1941, he decided to join the U.S. Army. And by September of 41, he was out in the Philippines. Uh, December 8th, you know, December 7th here in the U.S., but December 8th in the Philippines is when the Japanese attacked. And that's what led to the events that we'll hear from Colonel Frazier. Um, you all, most of you are pretty savvy as far as World War II is concerned. Other than his book that we've been selling, uh, you all are probably familiar with him from the Ken Burns series, The War. He was featured prominently in it, so much so that you could say he starred in it next to uh, Catherine Phillips. But... Uh, uh, you all can still see uh, many of his clips on his own website. You can see his oral history on our website, and I think there's still a pretty active Ken Burns PBS website. But uh, I do want to let you know that we do have Hell's Guest, which he's the author of, for sale in the back. And here to speak to you about his book and his experiences is Colonel Glenn D. Frazier. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Hey, it's a wonderful time to be in New Orleans. And I didn't know that uh, New Orleans was this friendly until just recently. But I'm sure glad that uh, I have the opportunity to come here to talk to you. Um, my, my talk or uh, my uh, report about my book that I wrote is in uh, the reason that I wrote this book is because of the mistakes that was made by USAF headquarters in the Philippines at the beginning of World War II. First off, the Japanese could not afford in any, in any sense of the word to have the Philippines in the hands of the Americans and trying to close off all of Asia. Their intentions were to take Asia and hunt down, and this is a fact, hunt, hunt down every American and kill them the same as and, and Hitler was doing to the Jewish in, in Germany. Now, I was just an old country boy and I really you know, patriotism runs, uh, was running wild in 1941 when the, the war in Europe was heating up and so forth. And, and I was on the farm and I was making $4 a, uh, $4 a week. That's $4 a month. I mean, a dollar a week, so $4 a month. And I could, I, food and clothing. I had to grow most of my food. And the clothing was hand-me-down. And I tell you, when I heard that I could go to the military 
and make $21 a month, man, I jumped on it. I thought that was a big deal. Man, I, I, didn't, I hadn't seen that much money since a long time. Anyway, but still there was lots of patriotism and all of the young people were trying to, there were no jobs available hardly, it's right after the depression. And we, we looked at the military as a way to help ourselves. The problem with me getting in the Army, I mean, getting out, some of them was getting in the Navy and Marine Corps, is I wasn't but 16, but I had the urge to go. And I asked my mother and father if they would sign for me to say that I was 17. With the signature then was of my parents, I could join. And they said, we're not going to lie for you. And I came from a good Christian family, and they wasn't going to lie and put it on piece of paper that I was six, uh, 17 when I wasn't. So I got really fed up. And I, my girlfriend that I had, that I, I liked all my life in school, I had found another guy she was going to see on July the 4th, 1941, going to be to see his family. And that was an invitation to marry in those days. So I said, honey, if you go, I'm not going to be here when you get back. So she said, I don't think I'm going to go. So we, I kept her out till 3 o'clock in the morning and went up, drove up to the house. My mother was out on the porch with a broom with the light on. I thought she had a gun. I, I got out of the car, and she said, uh-uh, you got to get back in that car and get out of here right now. And I can understand at 3 o'clock in the morning. And she said, my girlfriend said, Mama, I'm not going. And she said, don't you tell me that. I tell you what you're going to do. You don't make promises. So I, she, the next morning I hid and watched her get on the train. So I got on my motorcycle. I had a Harley, and I got on my motorcycle and went to Montgomery. I was, my, my hometown is Fort Deposit, Alabama. And I, I was trying to figure out what to do, and I went into a honky-tonk. And that honky-tonk, we could go in there then at our age. And I got a Coke, and I'm sitting there drinking it. And it, the manager came out here, some other people, the kids over there, and he said, I told you guys from Lowndes County not to come in here by yourselves. Those, those kids over there are going to give you a whipping. And, and I said, well, I'll, drink, I'll get through just quick as I drank my Coke. He grabbed it and said he threw me out then. And I got on my heart and started the street, and I turned it around. I had a mad streak. And I went back and I went in, he had two swinging doors. And I hit the first door on the right, knocked it all off the hinges, clear up to next to the bar. Went, got on that high polished uh, dance floor that he valued so much. And I dig a fit, dig a, did a figure eight on those, with those old black tires on that motorcycle. And, and I saw him come out and I made a streak straight out and, and I saw he had something in his hand and it was a gun. And I beat him to the door, and when I did, I knocked the second door out, clear out in the parking lot. So now I'm in one mess. I'm away from home, and I've, my girlfriend's gone. It's the 3rd of July, 1941. So I rode down the street after I got out of that mess, and there was a recruiting office. And I pulled in, and there was, my sergeant was standing there at the door, and he said, um, how old? I said, he said, can I help you? I said, I want to join the Army. How old are you? I said, 21. He said, well, if you're 21, you've got to have your draft registration as of July the 1st. I said, that's just it. I'm not, I wasn't 21 the 1st. I'm 21 today, the 3rd of July. An hour and a half later, I had my ticket with a train to Camp Shelby, Mississippi, and on my way to the Philippine Islands. <laughs> I thought it was a paradise and it was real good. I really liked it. And the Filipino people were wonderful and I really loved them. And we, but I went in and I, my wing, that I, air wing I was going to was out on maneuvers. So they took me and put, sent me over to the, uh, to the Philippine department, Mike Arthur's outfit and uh, for housing. And they came along six days later and, and gave us an option if, you, if we need some men, if you'll stay and, and go join to up, uh, uh, you sign up for three years and go to school, six, five and a half months or six, and be an ordinance officer in the Philippine Army, 
and you'll get, have a first or second lieutenant rating. And, and then when you go back to the States, you revert back to your own old rank, rank whatever it is, plus one, and you have guarantee OCS. Now, I was 16. Everybody else was older than I was. They thought I was 21. And, man, I thought that was the best deal I had ever made. I was going to be an officer when I got back to the States. But anyway, that's what it was. And I, and I enjoyed the Philippines and the people. And I can't dwell on too much now. I've got to tell you all some other stories. Well, we got the word early. We were out in Bataan. Uh, uh, my outfit was out in Bataan putting some ammunition into the warehouses. And we got the word that Pearl Harbor was hit. And we looked at each other and we said, and they notified us that be, uh, would be, we would be subject to being hit within two or three or four hours. About six hours later, the sirens blew and we heard the uh, formation of the planes. And they came in a lot heavier, a lot more, over a period of all day than they hit Pearl Harbor. They hit, uh, they hit Clark Field, destroyed every, nearly every aircraft. Nichols Field, same thing. Cavite Navy Station, same thing. The ships were still at dock and hit Cregador. We walked over and looked and, and watched the bombs drop on Cregador from our place on Bataan. And when we, our, our uh, sergeant, uh, Mass Sergeant Mahoney, said he was believe he'd just sit down and have a cup of coffee. He wasn't going over there and look at those planes drop bombs. And we went out there, and when we came back, he's sitting at the table, and here's a little monkey about that high, sitting there looking at him. We said, hey, where'd you get him? He said, the minute the, side the, the noise of the bombs dropping, he run down out of the tree and jumped up on that table and said, yeah, 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 right at me. He said, I've been dressed down by many uh, just drill sergeants, but never like that monkey did. So he, we tried to put his hands on him, and he'd, he'd boom, move and get back. Well, to make a long story short, I guess God sent him to us to help protect us because he could hear the jet planes before we could. And it wasn't long before he could distinguish between a couple of three P P-40s that we had and the jet planes. And if the, if the foxhole was like this and they were coming from this way, he was here. If it was coming from that way, he was over there. He knew where. And we could not beat him to the, to the foxhole. <laughs> so he was with us and left us there and we called him, we named him Radar. Anyway. Now, we got serious. I was from a Christian family, and I thought, we at war, and I, we're gonna have to kill somebody. And I had real problems with that. And so I was, that was going through my mind, and, and the, the commander came to me and, and told me he was gonna put me in charge of all ammunition moving to and from the front lines. I thought that was great. I just didn't know what I'd volunteered for. Because when you're going forward, it was a good job. When you're coming backwards, it's not any good at all. It's rough. Anyway, um, we, we, we never did. We got loaded up that day and went to Nichols Field, Clark Field, with 200, some uh, two or three full truckloads of 500-pound bombs. And we had no planes to, to put them on. MacArthur had denied the order to let them fly out and get off the ground, and they sit there. And when I got to Clark Field and I looked at those aircraft on that tarmac, uh, my whole crew included some Filipinos, tears was in our eyes, just even think about it. Same thing at Nichols Field. And instead of, uh, of when they, they, they came, they started, uh, invading us right after that in small groups. And around the 20th of December, the 14th Army, Japanese, one of the Japanese best armies, came into Lingayan Bay and came ashore. And USAF headquarters sent the Philippine Army up there at that particular spot, the main spot. And they, some of them were ill-trained, and some of them, and when I got up there with live ammunition for the rifles, 
It was about 20 something miles inland. They just, the Japanese just nearly run in there. And, uh, and they says, we, we can't kill them. We can't kill the Japanese. And he says, we shoot them 15 or 20 times and they don't fall. And I, I looked at the boxes they had and I looked at the, I said, is this what you're shooting? I said, yeah, this is what we went out to Fort William McKinley, four or five truckloads of practice ammunition. So when I got them some real, if it had a pop to it, they thought it was a, uh, had a bullet. So we got them some ammunition and that helped some, but the Japanese made it fast and General MacArthur ordered us to retreat back into Bataan. And that was a good deal for us as far as that's concerned, except he notified Roosevelt that it was a success. The road was it jammed, he couldn't even, it was snail uh, traffic. One road going in, <coughs> excuse me, we lost a lot of our ammunition, we lost a lot of our equipment, we lost a lot of our, our trucks and cars. The, the Japanese was like, like uh, bees around us and on that road and, and, and shooting and, and strafing us and bombing us and everything else. It was a complete chaos. But we stopped them the 1st of, Dece 1st of January, 1941. I mean, excuse me, 42. Get my date straight now. You have to re realize I'm 88 and my computer don't compute as fast as it used to. But anyway, we stopped them and started killing them. And what they didn't know, we knew Bataan. We knew what Bataan was. And we knew the places that we could pick. And we, and we picked the place that we'd fight them. We had a bulldozer and we cleared it up and we had, we had searchlights on the, back, on the top of uh, half tracks and we would uh, clear out and at night we had, uh, we had uh, alarm system set up and we, we'd turn those lights on when they heard, heard that the patrols of the Japs was coming in and, uh, and we'd kill them and then the half tracks would move and immediately after that the art artillery would come in. So we, we had our little tricks. We held them four months, and they had intended to be out of the Philippines in two months and go to Australia. Now, MacArthur didn't leave uh, until the, the 11th, of, uh, Mar 11th of March, and on the end of February, excuse me, the end of January, the 1st of February, they sent out uh, uh, approximately 50, uh, 12, uh, 15,000, but some of them was delayed and so forth. About 6,000 Japanese came in to establish a beachhead at the end of a Bataan to cut us half in two. Well, I was involved in the Agaloma Point battle, and what we did is we didn't have any guns to shoot down in there. They landed in there by mistake, about 5,000 of them, and I, I, got, I arrived on the scene in this Again, this major from Kansas asked me, said, what do you got up there in that arsenal that we can shoot down on there? I don't have but one anti-aircraft gun. It, we move it up against a tree once every four hours and shoot once every four hours. And I looked at the situation and I said, well, I got something you can do. I see that old building over there? I said, have you ever heard of a hog trough? Oh, he said he was from Kansas. I said, you ever heard of a hog trough? He said, what in the heck does that have to do with this situation? And I said, well, if you can build me some chutes in a V-shape like a hog trough, sticking out up next to a tree, sticking out over the bluff, and we can simulate putting our 30-pound fragmentation bombs in an airplane, tying that arming wire to the rack, opening the door, and then when it goes out, it sets the fuse for contact. So we'll tie that arming wire to the tree and shove them down on them. We did. And my, my colonel approved it, and we, we stopped them. And therefore, that, that knocked them out of going to Australia because the, Philippine, I mean, the, the, the Philippines was not taken by the end of January, 1st of February. And, and, and uh, so uh, we killed so many of them, they couldn't even take us when we were sick. We had no food hardly at all, half rations to start with. We killed all the mules and horses and the uh, caribous and all the uh, uh, lizards, the big lizards, the iguanas, and we even got into killing and eating some of the python snakes. Anything that wouldn't eat us first, we'd eat. And it became a chaos situation. 
MacArthur got out on the 11th of March, and he went to Australia. And the two days before he got out, he told us we were getting reinforcements any time. So this didn't leave a good, good thought with us because we felt very, very bad about it. And uh, in other words, we thought we'd been betrayed. But anyway, we fought on. And then General uh, MacArthur gave General Wainwright the order for us to fight to the last man on Bataan. Now, MacArthur didn't give anybody in some of the information, such as the first bombing of those bombs, uh, those bombers came in on the first day of the war. He didn't tell anybody that 6,000 people were killed instead of and only 2,500 killed at Pearl Harbor. He didn't do a lot of the reporting. He, he kept a lot of secrets from the news. In other words, the news wasn't like it is today. If it had been today, he couldn't have got away with it. Anyway, he ordered, MacArthur ordered Wainwright to fight to the last man. And he, Mr. General Wainwright, passed that order on to General King. And General King uh, said, I hear you. I receive your order, and if I'm, I'm alive and you're alive at the end of this war, uh, I'll see you in military court. He said, I'm, I'm uh, surrendering tomorrow morning. He didn't, they didn't know that he had received a message from General uh, Homa, the Japanese general, saying, I have the reinforcements to take you, and if you don't give up, I'm going to kill every living soul, and I come in there and take you and Bataan, and that would have been about 65,000 American and Filipino troops and about 38,000 old men, women, and children. So General King surrendered us, and that set up the death march. Now the death march, you've got to think about it being war, and they don't, the Japanese didn't come in to take care of anybody. So all the people in our, our hospital were gunned down, just murdered there. They just came in and killed them all. And they had, they said, march them, march them to the train station. And the ones that don't make it, don't feed them, don't give them nothing. And the ones that don't make it, fine. We'll use the ones for slave labor, of the ones that are able to make this march. I marched six days and seven nights, no food, no water, no sleep. I still made it. I just did. I, when I got to the end, I couldn't pick up my feet. I just had to drag them. And, and then uh, my tongue was starting to swell. Anyway, I did make it. And the first, we we'll got to Camp O'Donnell, and that was a hell hole within itself. You get as far away from the center of it as you could at night to try to sleep, and you stench your, smell, uh, stench your death would nearly burn your nostrils. So I volunteered to get out, and well, I want to tell you something. While I, while I, I saw Americans killed and just out there and laying and rotten, and they, they would become missing in action. No record of them getting. And I thought if I got killed, I had two sets of dog tags. I put my one set of my dog tags in a mass grave, with the idea that, that if that happened to me. Uh, my family would have some kind of closure. And I'll tell you later on what, what happened to those dog tags, but I'm going to go on here. <laughs> All right, so I we went to Talbot's Road Detail. 306 men on there, and then three and, two and a half, three and a half months total, only 25 was alive. They was in the jungle trying to build a road. Malaria, dysentery, and so forth. So I went to Billabid Prison, and then I went to, to stay there for a while. And we were so dirty and nasty when they got there, the, the Japanese ordered us to be put in the street and, and washed down with uh, uh, the city water hose. But anyway, I went to, left at Manila at 20th of March, excuse me, 20th of <laughs> uh, October, to 1942. Arrived at Moji, Japan, November the 2nd. 42, and was in five slave, four slave labor camps, four slave labor camps in Japan. We had we had wonderful rice. We had uh, most of 90 percent of the time we had rice with the little white worms with the black eyes that they wouldn't they wouldn't eat it so they fed it to us. 
And some, we complained every day about all kinds of things. We complained about that. And, we, and so one time, once upon a time, we'd get rice with no worms, and we complained about that. They took our worms away from us. So we, we didn't. Now, after we got settled, some of us decided to form a sabotage group. And they had to be close-knit because I saw a lot of guys that sell out for a bowl of rice. But anyway, we started sabotaging, and I haven't got the time to tell you all of them. I'm going to pick a couple of them. We was at Moji, I mean, in, uh, no, Kobe, I mean. Kobe was, um, uh, had a graphite factory there. We were, they were making, the, had these extruders for making these one-man submarine batteries with the, a with the graphite uh, core in it. And what they were doing was uh, these extruders were uh, large. Some of them was 12 inches in diameter, eight foot long. And we found out the good markings. They was making 300 uh, a month when we got there. They told us we were replacing the men that was had to go to war. Now that's something to tell us they're going to replace men to go fight our man, man on, on the front lines. So we started. We, we, we picked up the, net, the marking of good ones to be put by the railroad track. The bad ones were the markings which had to go around and recycled. So we started putting the good ones in the bad pile and the bad ones in the good pile. And God intervened because everything, we was inside of an industrial complex with big uh, factories all around us and we just knew the B-29s, we could hear them at night coming closer and closer, and we just knew it was going to be a time before they wipe us out, so we wanted to get out of there. So God intervened in a way that uh, we never expected it. A guy that never had an epileptic fit had an epileptic fit. So they jumped and said, what in the world is wrong with him? And we said, a highly contagious tropical disease. <laughs> and they said, what causes it? Well, when he, if you get too excited, so if you start to beat this guy, he's going to have, probably have an epileptic fit. So that night we went in and, and they took him and put him in a room. That night we went in and we stayed up till about 12 o'clock. All I was practicing that epileptic fit. Now, if, if you wanted me to lay down here right now and do one, I could, I could do it. <laughs> but we used that every time we could, we used that. Now, I haven't got much time left, I know, so what I'm going to try to do is all, all of the times that we sabotaged, we, we sabotaged a three-bay three, three bay dry dock. When they pour, we poured the concrete for the lock, the holding of the lock, and when we did, the, 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 when they put the ocean water in on it, all three of them busted from bottom to top, cracked from bottom to top. They would have something like a great big, one of the largest, electrical uh, steam shovels I've ever seen in my life or came from England. They said, don't bother that, don't touch it, and because we, we can't get any repairs, we can't get any pro and we, we, can't, we can't allow anybody to mess that up. That's, that's our key. So we'd plan fights to get a, their attention someplace else, and this, this electrician run in there and change some wires, and about a two weeks later, they turned Started, started that thing up and it just went and the smoke came out and that was the end of that one. We did everything we could. We'd steal anything we could and throw it away or anything. And if a guy came, if a, if a Japanese came to work and he had a box that he had his lunch in, he better watch it because a POW would get to it nine times out of ten. And if you did and you got caught, you got beat, well, what the heck, you got something to eat. That was about the way it was. They, they transferred us up then to, uh, out, of, out of the graphite factory, they transferred us up to Suruga, Japan, an inland port where a lot of rice and soybeans and dried fish came from Manchuria. So we were loading all these bags of rice and beans, and if you, if you put 380 bags of beans in those cars, they would work out four, four high, stack them four high. When you got to the door, you'd have two right, at, right here in front. So that little inspector would come along with his, uh, with his, uh, his pad and he'd look up and he'd say, how many? And we'd tell him 380. We'd go in there and put a real circle around the door and we'd cut him short and he'd put the seal on the, 
on the car, and I would think we had to get that seal off before it left the yard, meaning that they had somebody down the line stole it. And all of a sudden, we realized that the stuff was uh, the uh, soybeans and rice were stacking up in the warehouse. So we had to do something. So we started a fight. We had a fight, and we had guys that next to the out uh, next to the water on the docks, and they would throw. When we fighting over there, and nobody was looking. We throw in bags and bags of beans in the water. So one morning we were coming to work and they heard some commotion. We looked down there and we said, oh my gosh. And they had a dredge in there. They, they, we, we put so many in the water until the small ships couldn't even get up to the dock. <laughs> <laughs> so now we were up there and this interpreter came to us and said that, uh, that, that he was from the United States. He was born in the United States in Cleveland, Ohio, and he was the only one that was halfway decent to us, but he was, they watched him if he'd done one little mess wrong or told, him, told us anything, they'd kill him. But anyway, he told us that they had told him that all Americans, uh, POWs, would be shot when the Americans had landed on that homeland. Well, the Americans didn't know that they had uh, uh, something like 250 zeros loaded with highly explosives ready to come in and hit the, uh, the invaders, just dive into them, the landing and all that. So they said that they came, he came back a couple of days later and said that the Americans had dropped a bomb on Hiroshima. It was so big until if you were sitting 75 miles away reading the newspaper, you'd be petrified. He said it burnt the whole city down, killed everybody. We thought it was another, some kind of, of uh, some kind of propaganda to do something to us or whatever. But we didn't know anything about an atomic bomb. Okay. So anyway, here they the next morning they take us out to a rice field, and here comes two trucks. One truck had four machine guns and 16 soldiers. And the other truck had picks and shovels and had uh, 10 soldiers. So they gave us a place in that rice field, and they said, each one of us want a, I want a grave six foot long, four foot deep, and two foot wide, and we want it in two days. If you do not have it in two days, you're in trouble. Now, I'd like to ask all of you, what kind of trouble you think we'd be in anyway? <laughs> Going to dig your own grave. So we could have a Jap would jump in there and show us how to dig it, you know, and he'd dig and he'd throw out, throw out a lot of uh, 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 dirt, and the minute he left, here's what you do. You look kind of like this and watch him and pulling it back in, pulling it back in. So at the end of two days, we didn't have, but ain't nobody had over 15 inches. So the third day we went out and we thought they were gonna kill us that day because guess what they had there, huge, a big old uh, bulldozer. So that told us, you know, they were going to dig a big hole and put us in it. So it, it worked out that uh, time came, the lunch time came, and, and they, they were sort of close to the machine guns and so forth, but it wasn't as usual. And here comes a guy on a bicycle, and then they said, oh, we go in, in, into the camp to get a rice ball like we did the last two days. So we go in and they would knock on the door and say five minutes fall out to go back to the rice field. That's what they did the other two days. So they knocked on the door and said five minutes and a guy from the 200th Coast Artillery from New Mexico heard something and he run outside and he came back in. He said, fellas, he said, I, there's a B-29 right here in the valley. And he's coming right straight at us. The Bombay door is open, the wind is right and we don't have anything. We don't, if they've got one of those big bombs, forget it, we're gone. And it, that plane, that P-29 flew right toward us. I run outside and lay down on the ground out there where the fence was along with some others. And across the alley from us was a, a building about three football fields long. And it, they hit that, and that was a textile mill and killed about 400 Japanese. And they pulled us out. and actually had us help get out the dead and the, and the wounded. Next morning they came and said that the Americans and uh, Japanese were talking and uh, there would, could be a truce. Now let me back up now a minute. 
And well, then when the truce was signed on the 2nd of September in Oklahoma on the USS Missouri, the next morning, 21 of us took off and started riding the train at 500 miles. And we turned ourselves in at MacArthur's headquarters. And the rest of them stayed there 31 days. But when I got to San Francisco, I called home. Now, I didn't know that uh, they had been back in there and MacArthur took the Philippines back and they dug up that grave and found my set of dog tags. So I called home and my mother answered the phone. And I said, Mother? And she said, Who is this? And I said, Dowling. That's my middle name at home. And the phone went dead. Her sister was there visiting, and she answered the phone, and the phone went dead when I told her. So then my sister, my own sister, oldest sister, came to the phone and asked who it was, and I told her, and the phone went dead, dead again. I'm standing there hollering, hello, 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 and my daddy came to the phone, and he said, who is this? I told him, he said, well, I was the only one that didn't think you were dead. <laughs> but look at, it looks like I got four dead, I mean, three dead women here. I got to get them up off the floor. So he went and got a port pitcher of water and poured in there, and I pulled him in the face, and he said, they're coming to now, it'll be all right. Now, I came home, and I came home with a worst case of hatred that anybody in the world could get. Terry came home one night and said she's gonna buy a Toyota. I said, you gonna do what? I'm gonna buy a Toyota. I said, where are you gonna park it? She said, what do you mean, where are you gonna park it? Well, you ain't parking it here. You ain't gonna, I'm not gonna ride in it. I'm not gonna give you any money to pay for it or whatever. So we finally decided to get her a Saturn, an old American car, and the first month that broke down, and she said, see, I told you if I had my Toyota, it would be this trouble. Okay. So anyway, and, and I had nightmares. I started having nightmares. And I mean real nightmares. Sometimes my nightmares would continue on two or three days, the same thing, after I'd go to bed and go to sleep. I got me to the point I didn't even want to go to sleep. I'd have to be medicated nearly to go to sleep. I couldn't keep a I couldn't keep a wife going. This is the only one I ever kept going. I'm telling you. They'd all get scared of me. I'd get up in the middle of the night hollering and screaming and everything if some something unusual happened. And I just and I this went on for thirty years. And I had cancer of the lung, I had all kinds of problems, and I was just about dead. And my preacher told me, he said, you've got to get rid of the hatred. I said, listen, I can't do it. I said, I, I pride myself in hating those boogers. I said, you know, they, what they've done to me and my uh, fellow Americans, uh-uh, I can't do it. And he said, well, if you can't, you're going to have to live with this. You're going to be gone or something's going to happen to you because you can't live like this. So I d finally decided to do it, get rid of the hatred. I don't know anything about any of y'all. And I didn't know anything about what hatred was really doing to me. I didn't realize what hatred was doing to me. But if any of you has got that much hatred in a little bit, you better get rid of it. Because mine grew. After I came home, it grew bigger and bigger and bigger until it assumed my personality. It just took away... I couldn't hardly make friends and keep friends. And if I meet a, I met a Japanese in Los Angeles, and I told him, I said, his name was Sue Kasiwagi. I said, Sue, I, you and I are going to have problems getting along. He said, why? I said, because you're Japanese. He said, listen, buddy, I'm a Japanese, yes, born in American Japanese. I went to your, your countries, uh, our country, to fight in your, Europe against the Germans, they wouldn't let me go to Germany. I hate them too. So we got along. <laughs> but anyway, I just say get rid of it. It's the worst thing in the world could even happen to you. And when I found out how much I could care and love and find out what, and here I am standing here talking to you at 88, only 13, 13 more, I mean 12 more years, I'll be 100. And I'm trying to live a little bit longer. And, and she's helping me. 
So that's what I've got. That's my say so as to what to, what you try to do with your life. My book covers a lot of that. My book is a, a book that is written from straight from my heart, and I have I have no ghostwriters in it. It's just like I lived it. And and I think that if many of you have already bought a book, and I hope you enjoy it because it is factual and it is something that you need to take serious. And I just want to thank you. I don't have any more time. I don't think, unless anybody have a quick question. If you have a question, uh, please raise your hand. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I wish I had three hours to talk to you. And now that, uh, wait, I'm going to hand the microphone. But before, I'd like... Uh, Terry to stand up. Terry Frazier, please stand up and be recognized. This is Colonel Frazier's wife. She helped put this together and she helps keep the Colonel together. And having just gotten married last week, I know that's pretty important for, uh, for a guy to have along. So thank you very much for putting this together, Terry. And the first question's right here in the front row. I just wanted to ask if there were, I, I know the reputation of the Japanese, but in the camp where you were, were there any of them that treated you fairly well at the risk of their own, you know, their own peril, at their own peril. If you could say my yeah. Thank you. There was none of them that was willing to take that chance. And let me tell you why. When the trial was road detail, we found out I was busted. My head was busted. It was a prize bar. And we found out that uh, later on in life that a Japanese told, one, one that we call killer, told a guy from New Mexico, he said, if we didn't kill or beat uh, in a day some, from the headquarters, they would put, you've got to beat somebody today, you've got to beat two or three guys, or you've got to kill somebody to keep them in control. They would do it to them, and they would. Now, I didn't, tell, I didn't have the time to tell you about one other thing about my, they were going to cut my head off, and I talked my way out of it. She said it. That's when my, uh, Sales career started. <laughs> Colonel, right here. Uh, how long was your military career? How long was my military career? I was in five years, a little better than five years, during World War II the whole time. I put six years in the reserves, and when they wouldn't let me go to um, uh, Korea because of my sickness, because I was... Uh, on the, of, on the Bataan Death March and the Prisoner of War that long, they let me stay till that, yeah, that six years came, uh, went by. I went out and did my thing, whatever I wanted to do, and came back to Mobile, Alabama, and a friend of mine was a Brigadier General, and he wanted me in the National Guard. And I told him, I said, well, if you'll get me what I, the rate I, a rank I had when I was in the Philippines, I said, uh, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll come in, and that was a first lieutenant. All right, so he took it up, and I told him how they had to go in there and check my records through the Philippine Department and so forth, and a lot of my records, all of our records, a lot of it was destroyed and was never there, except what people told after they came back. Anyway, he proved me for a captain, as the adjutant general did, and when I went there to sign up and go, I mean, to go into the guard, uh, he said that my friend, the Brigadier General, said, I'm retiring. I said, I don't want to come in there with you and retiring. He said, well, I want to go over to the Alabama State Defense Force, which is part of the guard, under the guard in Alabama, and I'm going to uh, be the commander. I went over there, and I got 18 years in there. I told somebody they better ask me a question. 
Who was that? There's one in the back here, sir. <laughs> so, so it's safe to say that when you came back and you did your six years, they didn't honor the commitment to put you right through OCS? I didn't go to OCS. When I got back, I could care less. <laughs> but, but I did go to college, okay? I went to college instead. Right here, sir. Uh, it's something that you don't hear about a lot, but uh, how many other people did they send over to the home islands besides yourself? How many other, did, what? Besides yourself, because you don't hear about it a lot, how many other guys did they send over to the Japanese islands? <clears throat> you mean uh, to yeah, the Japanese if, island to be slave laborers? Yes, sir. Okay. 50, on, on Bataan, I'm not counting Corregidor, there were 15,000 Americans that started Bataan March. 3,000 was killed on the march. 2,500 more died at Camp O'Donnell as a result of the march. Then when, the, when they scattered us out all over Asia and the final count came home, it was approximately 4,000. So we lost 11,000 of the men that were originally started the march. And that sort of gives you some kind of idea of the loss. And 10% and, and of those died the first five years after they got home. We had all kinds of problems. Colonel, when you, you said that uh, you res ridded yourself of the hate, did you, have you ever been back to Japan? Back to Japan? No, sir. They, they even, as, as little as last, last year, last August, I guess it was, in Pittsburgh, there were two Japanese women that had, had, they were trying to get Americans to go back to Japan, and they would pay our way all the way, pay the food, and pay the air, airline, every expense, but they would have, give a, you one day to do what you wanted to do, and five days to do what they wanted you to do. And I'm not interested in going back. I, I, I really like to go back to the Philippines, but I don't have any desire whatsoever to go back to Japan, and I don't hate those people. Those people are wonderful. In fact, there's been this one little girl who prayed over me and asked me and prayed for forgiveness, a, J a Japanese girl. And the Japanese people today, I understand, are much different from then. They just had the wrong kind of uh, government and the wrong kind of training. Did MacArthur ever acknowledge what he did to you all? I'm back here. <laughs> no, he didn't. And I don't have time to tell you what he tried to do to me. Colonel, what was your lowest moment during your imprisonment? What was the worst moment you heard there? What do you say, honey? What was your lowest moment while you were in prison? <clears throat> when I was... Uh, I was up for execution for walking down the streets of Osaka with my hands in my pocket. And I talked my way out. I told him he could kill me, but he could not kill my spirit. And my spirit would lodge in his body and haunt him until the day he died. And he didn't want, he didn't want no POW spirit. Okay. He, he put me in solitary confinement. I'm in a hole in the ground five by five by five with a little bit of water in a, a bottle and one little rice ball. I was there seven days and seven nights. I got to the point to where I didn't even know who I was or where I was and what was doing and what going on. Not a, even a speck of a light I could see in seven days and seven nights. And, I, and, my, and my nutrition in my body was so so depleted until I didn't, I didn't, couldn't even get myself together to know if I had any family or if I even didn't even know my name hardly. And that was my lowest. And when I got out, the guy beat me and kicked me and broke the ribs in my right, broke three ribs in the right side and two in the left side and hit me in the back of the head, knocked me unconscious and everything. They tried to kill me, but they didn't get it done. I live, I live regardless. Colonel, yeah. to your far left here. Far left. Stand up, please. Good evening, Colonel, and thank you for your service. Um, earlier on, you had mentioned some specific military that mistakes that were made uh, in the Philippines, and I was wondering if you could comment on that a little bit further and whether or not you think those responsibilities will fall on MacArthur or perhaps the administration or whatever your opinion is on him in history. Thank you. Hey, 
I couldn't understand most of it. Sorry, sir. I just wanted to know uh, about the mistakes you said that may have been made in the Philippines before yeah. the attack. If you could comment on that, whether you think MacArthur was responsible for those or maybe it was the administration back home. Well, he had the last word and absolutely he, he, he ruled his command with an uh, iron fist. And I'll just tell you briefly, I made the statement that he left 21 nurses to die and they had a, the fifth airplane in southern Philippines and to go to Australia. And he had personal effects and stuff in there. And I made the statement that he left 21 nurses to die at the hands of the Japanese to save his, his, what is junk, you might say. Everybody's getting killed and all this kind of stuff. And he's worried about something he's got. And that plane, he was denied. And I had a witness, a live witness that was the first lieutenant on his staff. He denied to take stuff off of that plane and let those 21 nurses go. And, and those nurses were, we found the last four of them dead and uh, up above Tokyo. And that, that, that just showed, and when I t made that statement, he, th he had the FBI on me and threatening to do me in damage until I told him that I had a live witness that he would recognize. And then he, you know what he said? He said, he was in what, New York then. He said, oh, let me tell you, I'm, I'm sick and tired of this thing. <clears throat> Just some old kook. So I know now who the kook was. <clears throat> I'm sorry, folks. I know he's a hero to a lot of people, and I know he did a lot of good things, and he had a brilliant mind. But he was, uh, he didn't like the GIs. Why, if I'll ask you, why did he have, want us and when we were down to nothing and all why would he even uh, do order us to fight to the last man he didn't want some of the things told when they came, we came back but anyway front row here um back whenever you joined July 3rd was there ever a time during the whole time you were captive that you wish you wouldn't have joined How'd she say that? How'd you say that, that, that I had, had second thoughts, you mean? I didn't have second thoughts until it was too late. <laughs> I was on a ship from San Francisco going and I saw the, uh, the, 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 uh, the coastline going down late in the afternoon, going down into the water and disappearing. And I thought, you know, I'm the biggest fool of all of them. Here I am on this ship going to a country. I don't even know what their people are and who they are or what are they. And I've done this all to myself. And I said, I, I should be ashamed of myself. But, that's, but I said I couldn't change it because I couldn't. All right. The last word will be from Terry. No. No, this is... <laughs> This is the highlight of my time. I'm an Air Force brat named after ETO. I'm Elizabeth Terry Owens Frazier. So I'm one of you. And God likes acronyms. I got a POW. But anyway, I'd like to take this time to recognize all the veterans here who have served this great land. Without you, we wouldn't have this land. We wouldn't have our freedoms. So by your standing up, we would like to humbly say thank you. If you put on a uniform, stand up. We want to say thank you. Thank you for your service to this great country. Look at them. And I want to thank you all for being in attendance tonight. And I uh, certainly want to thank Colonel Frazier for giving us one hour when he probably could have given us, he said three, he probably could have gone on for four or five and we wouldn't even known the difference. But uh, I want to thank the Colonel for giving us a great show and telling us this important part of history. And uh, thank you guys for being in attendance.
great. It was great. We're going to get you. Yes, sir.